Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for having me as your opening address today. I represent the intersection of women in data at Stanford, and I'm pleased to say that we actually have quite a large number of people in that intersection, so thanks to the organizers for inviting me today. I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. I'm probably the only dean of engineering who has a bachelor's degree in classical trumpet performance. I think I can say that <laughs> with, with some confidence. Uh, I did make my way eventually to a PhD in computer science, and after that joined the IBM Almaden Research Center down the road here in San Jose. I was there for a few years and then moved to Stanford. That brings us to 1993, still quite a while ago. So I've been at Stanford over 25 years, and I have been in the dean's office as dean of engineering for just about two years now. So I'm going to talk to you about some important moments along the way of this journey. And I'm going to start out uh, back at the trumpet. Uh, I was in music school, and an interesting uh, hallway conversation pretty much changed my life. I was taking a class, an elective class in the music school on computer applications and music research. It was the first time I'd done any computer programming at all, and I was standing in the hall with another trumpet player who was taking that class, and he casually said to me, you know, you're a good trumpet player, but you're really good at this uh, programming stuff. And I started thinking about that, and I took a major turn in my life. So I just want to say to all of you, don't be afraid to change course if it feels right. The second thing I want to talk about that was a turning point in some ways was my first years at the IBM Almaden Research Center, where I was really launching my independent research career at that time. And I developed some research principles while I was working there, and I really stuck with them. And I want to tell a little story about how that happened. So when I arrived at IBM Almaden, my, I was given a task to design and implement a trigger system for the prototype uh, extensible database system. It was called Starburst. And at that time, this is now way back in 1988, there really weren't many trigger systems in databases. They're common now. But that was my task. So here I was at the beautiful IBM Almaden Research Center. Um, and there's me, sort of in my younger days. And I was working on my task, but I had done a PhD actually in programming languages, not in databases or data science. And so I said, wow, rule systems, they can be really complicated. Before I start building the system, I really want to think about the foundations. So I was thinking about semantics of rule-based systems and how complex it could be and try to nail it down. But then there was this guy down the hall named Bruce Lindsay. And a few of you may know Bruce Lindsay. He, he's not as scary as he looks there. He's a very famous database researcher, but especially famous for his systems building. And so he was constantly saying to me, what are you doing? You've got to start coding. And it was even worse than that, because I'm this young researcher uh, in San Jose. And across the bay at UC Berkeley, there was another really venerable researcher in databases named Michael Stonebreaker. And again, some of you may have heard of, about him. And at Berkeley, they were doing a competitive project to the one we were doing at IBM. And in fact, he was working on the trigger system. And he announced, well, we finished our trigger system ages ago. So there I was, not coding yet, thinking about the foundations, getting the pressure from these really senior guys in the field. But the truth is that thinking about those foundations first paid off. We built a trigger system where you could actually understand what it did, was semantically sound. Um, and in fact, in addition to it paying off, I would say it became a blueprint for my entire research career. Because my, I built my career again around the idea of developing the foundations of what I was working on before moving on to the implementation. I always did both, but one and then the other. Not really common in the database field. And so again, that was, a, I think, a very important turning point in how I approached research. So my conclusion from that is stick with your research principles or really your principles in general because payoff will come from that. <laughs> All right. The third thing I want to talk about is another hallway conversation that I had. And this one was much, much later. And this occurred at Stanford. And it was the fall of 2011. And I was in the hallway again. And Andrew Ng, a professor at the time, said to me, gee, why don't you join Sebastian Thrun and me? We're offering some free courses to the world. And this was the fall of 2011 when the first MOOCs, they weren't called MOOCs at that time, came out 
and launched what was really a great deal of excitement around the idea of free worldwide education. So I thought about it overnight, thought about Andrew's idea, and I said, sure, I'll join you. And I have to say that offering that MOOC at the dawn of the MOOC era was really one of my most invigorating academic experiences. And it was invigorating for many reasons. But I want to talk about just one of those reasons. So this class had around 25,000 people who were participating in, in it actively, and they were very enthusiastic. It was so exciting to see all the people all over the world, so grateful for the course I was offering. But there was one participant who stood out who I want to tell you about, and it's a participant whose name was Amy. And Amy answered 900 questions on the question and answer board during the course of 10 weeks. She had no discrimination against questions that might be naive or even people answering, asking questions that had already been answered before. Every one of her answers was correct. It was of perfect length. She even gave helpful examples to augment what was in the class. The class, the online worldwide class, just loved Amy. And this, is, this was our sort of hokey question and answer board at the time on our platform. And this is an outpouring of gratitude to Amy at the end of the course. So people are speculating, who is this Amy? Some people thought that she was me and I, I was disguising myself as her, or I planted a teaching assistant. In fact, somebody used the XML markup language and the xQuery language to xQuery query language to propose marriage to her. Of course, it was a joke. Um, <laughs> the only query she didn't know how to answer. Anyway, at the end of the course, I found Amy. I invited her to, I flew her actually to Stanford. I had lunch with Amy, and I talked to her about her career. And Amy decided actually that she was going to stay where she was working in her family's business. But I want to say to Amy, if you're out there, my offer still holds. So, <laughs> OK. So that MOOC was quite something. But I want to talk about something that I uh, embarked on that Margot hinted at uh, even more recently than that, just a couple of years ago, just before I became dean. I invented the concept of a MOIC. And I'll tell you in a moment what a MOIC is. So a MOOC is a massive open online course. So, a couple of years ago, I had a sabbatical, and my kids had both gone off to college. I've always been a big traveler. I loved the MOOC and the experience of bringing education to people all over the world, so I invented the MOIC, the massive open in-person course. It hasn't caught on, I'm afraid. I don't, I, I, but maybe if we're going to trend today, we can trend the MOIC. So, during my sabbatical, and I've actually continued to this day, I traveled to 18 developing countries so far, uh, offering short courses in what I called big data. It's really kind of data science. Um, and I also, while well, that was the main offering I gave, but since I was going to be traveling to these countries, I don't know how many of you are familiar with our D school, which uh, has um, invented the notion of design thinking and collaborative problem solving, but it's a really exciting way for people to work together on problem solving. So I got trained by them to give workshops as well. So when I, at each country, I'd give my short course, perhaps a workshop in collaborative problem solving, and then I typically would have a round table of some type with the women in the country. Just to give you an idea, here are the countries that I've visited so far, and I call this adventure Professor Widom's instructional odyssey. So you can see where I've been so far. Um, ongoing, as I said. Even though I'm dean, I managed to get out a couple of times a year. And so I wanted to finish today by telling you, showing you a few pictures and telling you a few stories around my travels. And I'm going to start with some pictures from the Big Data short course. So I started traveling, offering my course in Big Data. And one of the first things I noticed is in many of my countries, there were women sitting in the front row. It was awesome. So each place, you can see so India, Sri Lanka, uh, Tanzania, those women were right there in the front. But I want to tell a few more specific stories. So when I travel and teach my course, I often bring Stanford swag to give away to the students. And I give it away to the first ones to finish the little assignments I give. So as I teach, I'll give an assignment for that might take 10 minutes or so. And the first few people who finish that assignment will get some swag. And you can see here a couple of women in Sri, in Sri Lanka with their swag. Now, here I am in Bhutan. And in Bhutan, I had about 100 students. But all of the women sat together, which was fine. Um, and I had given an assignment, and I was walking around the room, and I took a peek at these women's uh, laptops, and they had finished the assignment. 
but they were not raising their hand to get the prizes. And I asked them what was going on. They were just so shy. They were afraid to raise their hand. They were afraid to talk to me. The guys didn't seem to have that problem. Now, here's a woman who wasn't too shy to claim her prize. This is in the country of Vietnam. And Vietnam was probably my worst ratio of men to women. So in Vietnam, there were probably eight or nine guys to every woman in the class. And so it took quite a while for a woman to win a prize. You know, probabilistically, that's what you'd expect. So when this one won a prize, I quickly had a photo snapped with her. And I post one Instagram per day when I'm traveling. And so that day, I posted the Instagram of this nice woman who won the prize. She was delighted. But then she got backlash on social media from the guys in the class who were jealous. They said the only reason I posted the photo with her is because she's a girl. It was really not, not a super attractive moment, I have to say. But there's good things for every uh, difficult thing like that. By the way, here's a picture that I, it has uh, nothing specifically to do with the short course, but I always have to show this when I'm talking about my travels. I was driving down the highway in Indonesia when I see my face giant on this <laughs> billboard. So I, uh, they spared no expense. So I went back and got a nice photo. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, the Women in Tech roundtables and tell you a couple of stories and show a few, t a few photos from those. So here are several photos. Like I said, in most countries, I'll get together with the women. And here's a bunch of the women. By the way, in the lower left there, the women all wearing black and white, that is in Thailand. And the day that I arrived in Thailand for my week of teaching was the day their beloved king died. And they all wore black and white for a year after that. So luckily, I had a few black and white things in my suitcase. Um, so that was interesting. Just a little sidelight. This is a group in the country of Peru, in Arequipa, Peru. And this is a group that was largely undergraduate students. So I asked those students, uh, what's it like in your classes? Do you have a lot of guys in the classes? And they said, oh, yeah, we're very often the only, um, the only women in our class. And then they went on and talked about when they're they are doing group projects in their classes with the guys. And they said that they started complaining about the Latin male and said that the guys expected them to bring refreshments to their group meeting. And by the way, the guys would be doing all the coding and they would be doing the documentation. Boo. Their response to that was to jump and do the coding and show they were better than the guys. So these were some uh, enthusiastic women with some real challenges. Another country where there were some really terrific women, but also with some challenges, is in the country of Tanzania. And this is a group of women at a graduate school in Tanzania. And all of these women had come and were staying at the university to get a graduate degree. Most of them were married with children, and they had generally left their husbands and their children back in their village. And when they talked about it, they said they're there because they have very enlightened families, very enlightened uh, husbands generally. Um, but they also said that their villages had typically shunned them for what they were doing. Pretty interesting. So, you know, a couple steps forward with their families, but not all the way yet with their villages. But, like I said, for every good story, for every difficult story, I'm sorry, there's also a good one. And I wanted to close with this group of women from the Philippines. So this was a power group of women in Manila, Philippines. There's even a congresswoman in that group. And they were just making change in their country. It was really impressive. So above the head, you can see it says the future. I really felt those women were the future of the Philippines. And they gave me inspiration for all of these women that we've seen all over the world. So thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me for the welcome address. I'll be around part of the morning and back for the reception in the evening. I look forward to talking to many of you. So welcome, thank you, and enjoy the day.